third chapter, which is called Karma Yoga. Tonight, we will study text 42. Tomorrow night, the last verse, 43. So tonight, text 42. The working senses are superior to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind, and he, the soul, is even higher than the intelligence. Report. The senses are different outlets for the activities of lust. Lust is reserved within the body, <clears throat> but it is given vent through the senses. Therefore, the senses are superior to the body as a whole. These outlets are not in use when there is superior consciousness or Krishna consciousness. In Krishna consciousness, the soul makes direct connection with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And therefore, the hierarchy of bodily functions as described here ultimately ends in the Supreme Soul. Bodily action means the functions of the senses, and stopping the senses means stopping all bodily uh, actions. But since the mind is active, then, even though the body may be silent and at rest, the mind will act as it does during dreaming. But above the mind is the determination of the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the soul proper. If, therefore, the soul is directly engaged with the Supreme, naturally, all of the subordinates, namely, intelligence, mind, and senses, will be automatically engaged. In the Kapta Upanishad, there is a similar passage, in which it is said that the office of sense gratification are superior to the senses, and mind is superior to the sense objects. If, therefore, the mind is directly engaged in the service of the Lord constantly, then there is no chance that the senses will become engaged in other ways. This mental attitude has already been explained. If the mind is engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord, there is no chance of being engaged in the lower propensities. In the Kapta Upanishad, the soul has been described as Mahan, the great. Therefore, the soul is above all, namely the sense objects, the senses, the mind, and the intelligence. Therefore, directly understanding the constitutional position of the soul is the solution of the whole problem. With intelligence, one has to seek out the constitutional position of the soul and then engage the mind always in Krishna consciousness. That solves the whole problem. A neophyte spiritualist is generally advised to keep aloof from the objects of the senses. But aside from that, one has to strengthen the mind by use of intelligence. If by intelligence one engages one's mind in Krishna consciousness, by a complete surrender under the Supreme Personality of God, then automatically the mind becomes stronger. And even though the senses are very strong, like serpents, they will be no more effective than serpents with broken fangs. But even though the soul is the master of the intelligence and mind, and the sense is also still, unless it is strengthened by association with Krishna, in Krishna consciousness, there is every chance of falling down due to the agitated mind. Translation once more. The working senses are superior to dull matter. Mind is higher than the senses. Intelligence is still higher than the mind and he the soul. So one direction is called the... These are just the typical names and I don't want to explain them too much. But one direction of inquiry into what is the truth is called the cosmological question, cosmological inquiry. Now, what that means because as you know, the cosmos is a universe. It is the world out there, what we see, full of so many things, which are perceived by our senses. So the, the whole question of this cosmological direction of inquiry is what is reality? What is? It's, you can just focus this one word, is, isness, is, big block letters three lines of me. <laughs> Cosmologicus. Cosmo... What is it? Cosmologists. Yes. Cosmologists. They're concerned with that. 
reality as as the state of existence. What is what is simple? So the cosmologists they run into this problem uh, of mind and body, and they actually don't know how to solve it because isness it's not very functional, is it? It's just a state, a state of existence. So uh, one is perceiving, one is existing, and perceiving that there are things out there which exist, or do they exist? This is where the problem starts. This is right where the problem starts. Because here I am consciousness, and as consciousness, I am, and this has to do with the consciousness uh, consciousness in superior position, uh, as explained here by Lord Krishna. You would have paratastu saha. Saha means he or the soul is parataha, superior to matter. And the first, the highest level of matter is budhe, intelligence. And the guru's mind, senses, and the gross body. So he is superior to all that. And therefore, his expectations are sublime. When he looks out, because of the way he is inside, he's superior, then he's looking for the superior outside. That's his nature. But looking outside in this cosmos, one becomes disappointed. Our consciousness mirrors, it's like a mirror in a sense. Our consciousness mirrors an imperfect world. A world that is limited, or we want to be unlimited. A world that is temporary, or we want to be eternal. A world that is full of suffering, or we want to be happy. These are the innate desires of consciousness. But it doesn't, these desires are not, we don't find the correspondence out there. So, because of that, one speculates. This is the origin of all speculation. Just like Lord Rama, the lotus opened, he looked around and he didn't like what he saw. He didn't like what he saw because he didn't see anything. <laughs> it was all dark. So Prabhupada says he was the first scientist. <laughs> he looked out, he didn't like what he saw, couldn't understand it. Why is it there? Why is it like this? Why is it black and dark? What is it? And so he began to speculate. And as a result of speculating, he grew four heads. <laughs> and then he performed the first experiment, climbing down the lotus <laughs> stem. But he didn't find anything that way. <laughs> so, this is, it's from this, this problem of uh, cosmology, that uh, science and speculation, and all forms of philosophy, different branches of philosophy have arisen. So, Srila um, Bhakti Vinod Thakur and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati have pointed out the very typical forms of uh, the speculation that comes from the cosmological search for the truth. Of trying to understand what is reality. So, uh, one speculation is that I am reality, I am Brahman. Mm -hmm. This is a classical Maya body position. Aham Brahmasmi. I am Brahman and what is out there, what I am seeing, is Maya. It's just illusion. It has no substance at all. Another speculation is uh, to think that Brahman, myself, and Maya are actually the same. Hmm? They're the same thing. Just I am mirroring that out there. But it's the same, it's me. Um, another is that actually, yes, yeah, is, is that Maya is the truth. Maya is 
the reality, right? The Buddhist state of mind is like that. That I don't exist separately from that out there. Another idea is, there's another position in the, uh, classical Indian philosophy, some key philosophers take this, that there is no one single Brahman. It's not that, there's, that I am one absolute truth. And everything else is just my imagination or whatever, but I'm the center of everything. But their idea is that there are many, many jivas, unlimited jivas, and each one is having his own hallucination. So this is very problematic. There's so many, many individuals, and each one is hallucinating in his own way. How are they ever going to get along? So these are different speculations. And there are also uh, Western speculations. Actually, in European philosophy, this whole abstract uh, mathematics, higher forms of calculus and everything, have also come out of the same type of speculation, mind, body, mind, body. Uh, this German philosopher Leibniz, he thought that the truth is not to be understood in either position, either from the position of mind or matter <coughs> out there. Rather, it is some kind of harmony that is exchanged between the two. And that harmony is understood through the logic of mathematics. So, um, European science, Western science actually, this is one of its important roots. That reality is to be understood in, in abstract uh, mathematical constructs. This is where modern scientists try to find the truth, isn't it? Uh, not in the way things look out there, and also not in what we think in here, but in some kind of very, who can figure it out? <laughs> but some kind of very esoteric speculation, you know, exchange between the two points. Which, are, which is represented in all kinds of squiggles and symbols, uh, which no one can understand, including the scientists themselves. So. <laughs> so this is the cosmological problem. Simply looking at what is, trying to understand what is reality, in, but not paying attention to, which is the next line of inquiry, not paying attention to the source, uh, the dynamic source. This is called in philosophy teleology. It comes from uh, Greek root telos. Telos means purpose. So, uh, another simple way of translating teleology is the argument from design. Simply that, uh, this is very traditional, that this universe has a form, has a distinct form made up of parts that work together. You can compare it to a watch or an organism or whatever you want. But it is constructed, it's put together, it's not uh, just chaos. It is not illogical. It has a logical order. So, appreciating that, one can conclude that if, it, if the effect shows intelligence, then it must have an intelligent cause. Because intelligent effects don't just fall together. Of course, that is a great uh, illogical conclusion of many scientists today, so-called learned people. They fall back on the theory of chance. They don't like this teleology. They try to banish this whole line of inquiry from modern intellectual life. And they fall back on a theory of chance that you can trace uh, effect to cause and then to a previous effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, cause, effect, cause. But there will be no ultimate cause from which all other effects have come. There will just be accident, chance, big bang, some explosion out of the 
void. But then, the funny thing is, is when these scientists try to, they, they feel that they have to prove that. This is what is uh, illogical logic, you see. That their thought process goes back to an illogical origin of everything. Uh, a big bang out of nothingness. Now, Prabhupada, because Prabhupada used to deal with these theories, uh, you can say, in simple language, not in simple thought. Prabhupada was looking down from millions of miles upon these ant-like intellectuals of the modern world. But he would refute their arguments with very simple words. And he would say, for instance, explosion, Explosion means there must be dynamite. <laughs> there must be an explosive. There must be something that explodes. What is this explosion out of nothing? That is illogical. Yes, that is illogical. So if one is really going to practice this philosophy, if one is really going to be an acharya of this philosophy, then he should just leave it at that. But no, these scientists even try to logically explain this illogical explosion out of nothing. And thus they write volumes and volumes of theories, mathematical theories, to try to show how something could have come out of nothing. <laughs> so again, they, they go behind the illogical non-cause to establish a cause, you see. So they, they can't give it up. It is, it is a natural process. Natural is the nature of intellect to seek out the cause. As soon as there is intelligence, it must seek out a cause. You can't stop it. And this uh, this uh, idea of you know some illogical origin of everything, big bang or void or whatever, this is just a bluff. Prophet said they don't know, so they give some bluffing explanation like this. But. This won't help. This won't establish anything. So, one has to actually take the teleological approach. This is, in our terms, we call this Vedanta. Vedanta means to seek out the cause of all causes. Atato Brahma Jignasya, to inquire into Brahma, which is defined as Janma Desyamata, the origin of everything. Brahman is that from which everything comes. This is the proper teleological inquiry. And what is wonderful about this, unlike the other cosmological inquiry, which is just concerned with isness, you know, static, abstract isness, what is we this is this is actually jnana, the jnana process. In Vedic terms we would call this jnana yoga. By speculation alone, they try to by uh, pratyaksha and anuma. Pradyaksha means by perception, perceiving what's out there, and Anuman means speculating. So just by this, they try to understand, they try to establish what is real and what is not real, and they can never come to any conclusion that Lord Krishna himself declares in the, the other night I mentioned the Uddhava Gita. So there is a verse in the Uddhava Gita, a very nice verse where Lord Krishna says, they will just go on speculating, arguing endlessly. This is real, this is not real. Different groups of philosophers. From the beginning of time to the end of time, Krishna says, until they surrender to me, they're condemned to just go arguing in this way, different ways. This is real, this is not real. No, you're wrong. This is real. This is not real. No, you're wrong. This is real. This is not real. It's all they can do. So this, is, this type of inquiry will not actually establish ultimate reality. Why? Because reality is functional, it's dynamic, it's not static. This armchair speculation, sitting around and just staring into space, is completely unrealistic. Because the world doesn't the world doesn't work that way. The world works, put it that way. The cosmos is a functional system. It has design, it has purpose, it has work. So one has to inquire into from where all this came. Who is the designer? Who gave the order? 
And that is Krishna. That is established in the Danta and the natural commentary of the Danta, Srimad Bhagavatam. That is established by Lord Krishna himself in this Bhagavad Gita. So when the cause is known, then, this is what Sri Prabhupada is saying, uh, explaining the same point that uh, in Krishna consciousness the soul makes direct connection with the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Therefore the hierarchy of bodily functions as described here ultimately ends in the Supreme Soul. Why is that? Why does it end in the Supreme Soul? Because it begins in the Supreme Soul. That's why. This is, this is logic. This is logic. Why should the functions of our body, our senses, our mind, and our intelligence, and also our very soul, end in the service to the Supreme Soul? Because they begin in the Supreme Soul. This closes the circle of logic. And just trying to understand what is without this functional relationship, then you just, you know, floating out the window, your head like a big <laughs> helium balloon, <laughs> drifting off into the wind currents of mental speculation. Who knows where you'll end up? <laughs> so this is this is the natural philosophy. And this solves the mind-body problem. That what is the mind or the consciousness that is the soul. The soul is the emanation from Krishna. And the intelligence, the mind, the uh, senses and the body are what are called the upadi. The upadi of this emanation. Upadi means the designations. is external attributes. These attributes are given by Krishna to the soul for one purpose, that he can re-establish his functional relationship because that relationship is functional. So he's given these tools. Because to function, you have to have tools. To do work, you have to have tools. So Krishna, by His mercy, gives those tools. So those tools are meant to be engaged, or as Prabhupada so nicely said, dovetailed. Uh, this is a term from carpentry. Uh, when a carpenter joins two pieces of wood, say a piece of furniture, uh, you'll find, if you take any piece of furniture apart, you'll find how the wood has notches or holes and pegs or whatever. This is called dovetailing, like the tail of this bird, dove. It divides like this into its feathers. And so it, it, the wood can also be fashioned that way, joined with a corresponding piece fitted together. The carpenters are very expert. They don't even need to use glue. They're very expert in joining wood just in that way. So these upadi, these sensory tools are given by Krishna to us so that we can engage our consciousness in His service. Now this is, this is what is essential. Consciousness, Srila Prabhupada writes here that uh, the, uh, in Krishna consciousness, he, he mentions this twice in the purport, in Krishna consciousness the soul makes direct connection with the Supreme Personality of God. Also at the end, uh, unless it is strengthened, that is the soul, unless the soul is strengthened by association with Krishna, in Krishna consciousness, there's every chance of falling down to, due to the agitated mind. So that is the essential point, that we are like Krishna, in that we are conscious. So the consciousness should use the tools of the intellect, mind, senses and body to fix itself on Krishna. It uses these tools, but the connection is direct. This is another sort of fallacy of those who are bewildered by this mind-body problem, whatever. This bewildered by speculation and perception. They sometimes demand, show me God. That means that they expect God will appear as a sense object, you see as a sense object that will, that will come under the control of their very limited and significant bodies. <laughs> they don't understand 
that the perception of God is through purified consciousness. And one has to know how to use these upadis in, in such a way as to purify the consciousness. And then one will have pratyasha bhagavan dharmyam, direct perception of the Supreme Soul uh, through uh, purified awareness. Not through uh, some type of, you know, again, like the scientists, extending these material senses by telescope or microscope or whatever. Or also by some mystical process, by some magic, Shazam, and then after the star is clear, oh, there's God. No, there's a process of using the senses, mind, intellect, for self-purification, purification of consciousness. So people are too much, whose consciousness is too much attached to matter. They cannot understand this. When they cannot understand the deity. They cannot understand how to see the deity. They will demand, show me God. And you say, here's God. And they will say, that's just a statue. Why do they say that? Because they do not know how to see God. It's like, I've often given this example. It's like seeing time in a clock. If one looks at a clock, and doesn't know how to tell time, then he only sees the material, gross, external features of the clock. You see, like a child, I'm sure a child a clock. What does a child, how does a child see a clock? Completely different from a grown person. A child just sees glass, and just sees plastic and numbers, and doesn't see anything more. But a person who knows how to tell time, because his consciousness is, is it, you can say, purified in a sense, or elevated, he can tell time. Therefore, he sees the clock completely different. He sees time. Time is a form of Krishna. <laughs> Krishna says, I am time. So he can see time in this clock. So a materialist, he cannot see the Lord in the deity form. He sees only a statue. So that means he doesn't see. Because the consciousness is not there. The Krishna consciousness is not there. He does not know, Prabhupada said, Krishna is the origin of everything. Everything comes from Krishna. So of course the deity is Krishna. Huh? As much as as much as you can say everything is Krishna. But Prabhupada says these rascals, there's some Mayavadis who say God is everything except the deity. <laughs> <laughs> why do you bow down? Why do you bow down to the deity? God is everywhere. Well then why not bow down to the deity? <laughs> that was Prabhupada's answer. <laughs> so, anyway, yes, God is everything, but uh, you see, God receives our service in a particular way because although this is transcendence and immanence, although He is immanent, He is everywhere, still He is a transcendental person. This is the wonderful Achincha Veda Veda Tattva philosophy. So as a transcendental per person, he appears in a specific way to receive our service. As much as, but this is very logical, as much as water is everywhere. Huh? Water is everywhere. Water is inside your body, water is in the atmosphere, water is in this wood, water is in the stone, water is everywhere. But when I'm thirsty, I can't just go... <laughs> <laughs> Here is water. <laughs> is this idol worship? <laughs> is this sectarian? <laughs> oh, why are you drinking water from this cup? Water is everywhere. <laughs> you live by that philosophy. See how long you live. <laughs> God has a prerogative. Oh, he's everywhere. He is supreme. He's not, he's everywhere does not mean he's confined by everything. You see, I remember once talking to a long, long time ago, one girl who was interested in Krishna consciousness. She was buying books. And then I was explaining, she was interested in a superficial way. She heard that she was eager to buy the books. So I was just, because I saw some interest, so I was saying a few things. And then when I was telling how Krishna appears, he appeared 5,000 years ago. 
she became very shocked. She said, God can't appear in this world. And I said, if he's God, why can't he appear in this world? Who says he can't appear in this world if he's God? And then she, oh, <laughs> we'll all have to think about that. <laughs> So God, because He is God, He appears as He likes, in the form He designates as His very Self, the Self to whom we should offer obeisances, the Self whom we should serve in a personal way. And He receives that service. So in this way, in that consciousness, one can see Krishna in the deity. It requires, Prabhupada says twice here, Krishna consciousness requires Krishna consciousness. And then one can nicely use these senses in serving Krishna, even though they are material upadis, but they are, as is explained, they are all based upon, uh, based upon the soul, saha, he who is parata, who is transcendental. So these are coverings. This is also Vedanta philosophy, what are called the koshas the coverings of the soul. Anamaya, the first gross covering which grows by eating. Anamaya. And then there's pranamaya, the subtle pranic body. Manamaya, the mental body. The jnanamaya, the intellectual body. So these are coverings of the soul. But they're coverings of the soul. So that means the soul has its own original intellect, mind, and senses, which are spiritual. And which manifest as we engage these coverings in Krishna's service. Because what is, how do they manifest? Simply that these coverings are then purified. This is the, you see, since Krishna is the source of everything and Krishna is the Supreme Spirit, and everything is a manifestation of His energy, which is spiritual, that means ultimately everything is spiritual, including these senses, mind, body, intellect, all of that is also ultimately spiritual energy. And by engaging this in Krishna's service, then the spirituality of everything is realized. This is, this is again the same understanding the source, how Krishna creates by what is called parinama vat, transformation of his energy. And one can understand how everything can be transformed back. Now we're having this mind matter problem, which no one can solve. Somebody asked, I think it was they say Einstein and some other philosophy. What is mind? And he said, no matter. And then they asked, what is matter? And he said, never mind. <laughs> <laughs> so they go on like this. <laughs> they go on like this because it is abstract. But when one understands how mind, matter, everything is a transformation of Krishna's spiritual energy, then one can know how to transform it back, just like when we offer prasadam to the Lord. Actually, we offer boga to we prepare for the Lord uh, cooked preparations, which are boga. That means that if one eats that before offering, one will get karma. It is matter, it is material. One gets karmic reaction. But when you offer it to Krishna, it is transformed, it is spiritual. And then when you eat, you're liberated. This is amazing. Yes, but it is true. <laughs> and how do we know? Again, by direct perception to purify consciousness. So, this we have to have. There was a young man who was challenging a sage. One sannyasi was, uh, had come on his tour to one village. He was staying outside the village just living under a tree. And every day he was giving lectures, so the villagers would come very respectfully. And he was teaching them Bhagavad Gita, Vaishnava Sannyasi. But one young man, he was very, he was up to date, so that means a Buddha, very skeptical. So he came to the lecture, and at one point he just couldn't sit still anymore. He was getting more and more agitated as he heard the preaching of Bhagavad Gita. Finally, he jumped up and said, What is this? You're always talking about God. But I don't see God. 
You talk God, 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 but where is this God? I can see Bombay, Hollywood stars, or Bollywood, whatever they call them. <laughs> These I can see. I can see this world around me. But this God that you say to whom I should surrender, give everything, I do not see. So how I can surrender to that which I cannot see? Show me God! So he was challenging. You are supposed to be a wise man, realized in Bhagavad Gita, then you show me God, then I will surrender. Until you show me God, then everything you're saying is just so much hot air. Just talk, 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 useless. You know this Sanyasi, he was a very saintly person. So, very mildly he heard all this out. And then said, seeing God is not so easy. My senses are contaminated. So they must be purified. And to purify them, you have to accept the process which Lord Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. Just like to study any difficult subject matter. There's so many subjects in the school uh, which are teaching things which we also do not see. So one has to prepare oneself. First of all, one has to have faith. You see, if you want to become an uh, advanced mathematician or any, uh, any higher category of scientist, first of all, you have to have faith in the process itself, in the school itself. So he was speaking like that, but the young man was too agitated. And again, he began to doubt and denounce. Don't talk, don't divert the conversation. I commanded one thing, you show me God. Scientists, they may have their theories, whatever, but they can show something. You're not showing anything. Show me God. So like this conversation went back and forth. Finally, the sannyasi said, he turned to all the other people and I said, I fear that our young man here has a great problem, great psychological problem. And they were all agreeing because they were pious people thought there was something wrong with him. And at the same time, he was a little curious. What do you mean, Psycho I have a psychological problem? What are you talking about? <laughs> and the sannyasi said, yes, I think you have some problem in your mind, but don't worry, I can cure it. I have a treatment. What is that treatment? And the sannyasi said, yes, it is a very old Vedic treatment. It's called the Kamandalu treatment. Kamandalu means water problem. Uh, sannyasi was very nice big brass waterfall. Oh, commando treatment. What is that treatment? The boy was skeptical. Well, you just have to come here close. <laughs> Lean your head a little close. <laughs> so, just to test that young man went. Lean forward. Come on, come on ahead. As hard as he could. He drew blood, and the young man was on the ground, and he was screaming and crying. <laughs> And then he began to denounce the sannyasi. You rascal! You hit me! You're not a holy man! You're a criminal! <laughs> and then police were called, and the whole thing was brought before a judge. <laughs> so the judge asked, first of all, the young man, what is your complaint? And the young man, began to speak very, very harshly about the sannyasi. This man is a rascal. He's dressed up in saffron as a holy man, but he is simply a thug. He's simply a criminal, a, a gunda. <coughs> he attacked me. He beat me on the head with his commando. Just see, the mark is there, blood is there. So he must be punished. Posed as a holy man, coming into town, speaking so much nonsense, bewildering everyone, and then beating me on the head. <laughs> so then the judge he turned to the sannyasi and said, what, what do you have to say about, in response to this young man's accusation? The sannyasi replied, oh, I'm very surprised. <laughs> I told this young man exactly what I was doing. It had nothing to do with attacking him. I said I would give him a treatment. <laughs> An old Vedic cure called the Kamandalu treatment. <laughs> and that's what I did. 
I have no malice in my heart. I do not intend to do anything bad to him. Sometimes, when, you know, when a doctor applies a cure, it causes pain. <laughs> it's best, but that's part of the cure. No one complains. So I don't understand why he's complaining. And then the young man became very excited. What are you talking about? Treatment. You hurt me. You hurt me. I was in intense pain. I was in agony. What kind of treatment is that? How did you help me? So the judge said, Your Holiness, what do you have to say about that? And the sannyasi replied, Well, my question is, what is he talking about now? <laughs> Just what do you mean? You say, I hurt you. You said you were in agony, in pain. What is this pain? A pain, pain! I was in pain! <laughs> well, if you were in pain, then show the judge your pain. <laughs> so how can I show the judge my pain? Pain is not something you just show. Pain is something you experience. <laughs> so he smiled and said, and so it is with God. <laughs> and then the young man, he, he was stopped. You know, all his mental speculation suddenly came to a halt. <laughs> and he began to think about that. Yes, I demanded that he show me God. And now he demands that I show my pain. But I know that I was in pain. Maybe I cannot show him like that, but I know I was in pain. Pain is real. Everybody knows pain is real. <laughs> so, logically, then, what he says makes sense, yes. <laughs> So then he fell at the sannyasis with his feet and requested to be accepted as a disciple so that he could learn to experience, to directly perceive God. Yes, yeah, so there is a process, just like the Kamandalu treatment. There is a process. <laughs> <laughs> to experience this pain. Similarly, there is also a process to experience Krishna. God. It is a science. So if we accept this science, that giving due deference, due uh, faith to this science as we would to any other science, if we actually desire to realize the goals of these other science, uh, sciences. So if we invest the same amount of faith and practice it uh, to the best of our ability, then Krishna will reveal himself was through the medium of consciousness. This is the medium of relating to Krishna, the medium of consciousness. Right now, our consciousness is lusty, as explained. Uh, and so because our consciousness is lusty, we are bound up in bodily conception. <coughs> but when the consciousness becomes free of lust, then one ascends to the spiritual conception. And in the spiritual conception, one can know oneself as eternal servant of Krishna and eternal of Krishna as the eternal master. Shiva Prabhupada Ki Jaya. Are there any questions? Yes. I'm sure we can use this verse. And we understand this verse around us. I'm sure we can use this verse. It was a very important one. Yes. Yes. Real, the reality is Krishna. Krishna and Krishna's energy. So, the world is real in that sense. That it is Krishna's energy. But, when we put our own value upon this world, value which arises from our lusty desire, our interests which are separate from Krishna, then that value which we ascribe to the things of this world is mine. That is mine. <coughs> Just like uh, in one conversation in Australia, uh, in Melbourne, in Prabhupada's room, uh, 
in the Elburn Temple, there's a museum, Prabhupada House, so his room is preserved. So uh, in that same room, uh, years ago, Shri Prabhupada was having darshan. And uh, so he uh, gave the example of one Mataji who was there. She was quite attractive, quite good looking young lady. So he said, why shall we not use her beauty in Krishna's service? Without the fine quality, I think it was a piece of cloth of some sort. So the fine quality of the workmanship of the gift was pointed out. It's made of good materials, very nicely produced. And then another devotee sitting by made the comment, but this is all temporary. This is all temporary. In other words, trying to say that this is, these are illusory values. The Prabhupada corrected and said, no, if it is used in Krishna's service, then it becomes really valuable. Then these qualities actually become uh, worthwhile or useful in Krishna's service. And then he gave the example of this Madhaji. Just like this Madhaji, uh, why shall we not engage her beauty in Krishna's service? Because the point is, if we do not do this, then uh, it will be that same beauty will be engaged by mind. And this is the illusion, the illusory value. Things have their value in relationship with Krishna, but when I, when I impose my own separate value, this woman is very beautiful because she pleases my senses. She is meant for my pleasure. That's mine. One, therefore, but mind is immediately contradictory, counteracted. When we just accept everything is Krishna's energy. This Maharaji, that car, this building, this city, everything is Krishna's energy. And again, this understanding that establishes the purpose of everything. Once we establish the source, then the purpose becomes very clear. It's, it's, a, it's a logical progression. Seeing how Krishna is the source of everything establishes the use of everything in relationship to Krishna. And that is reality. Now, we know that because uh, of uh, this Mahamaya manifestation, everything here is temporary at the same time. So it's not real in that sense of being eternal, but it is real in the sense of being connected to Krishna. There's an example of that that you all heard, the iron and the fire. When the iron is placed within the fire, it becomes red hot, just like fire. Same quality. If you take the iron out of the fire, then again. So although the things of this world are temporary, still, if they're engaged in Krishna's service, they become facilities for cultivating Krishna consciousness. Just like this building, why is it different? Why is it different? Or any temple, any ISKCON temple, why do people, when they walk into an ISKCON temple, why do they immediately feel transformation? That they're in a pure environment. How is this any different? There's the same uh, elements, the same ingredients as any other building. But again, it's the point of consciousness. This building, this restaurant, and temple is being used in Krishna's service. So because of the consciousness of Krishna, as soon as someone walks in, then he feels, I'm in the spiritual world. He feels this place is very different. He may not understand immediately why. He may not like it also, because he's a demon. <laughs> he may turn around and go right out. <laughs> or he may want to cause some trouble because he doesn't like that that feeling of, of spirituality, of purity but he feels it and that's because everything is connected to Krishna and therefore everything is transformed that doesn't mean when we say Govinda's restaurant is spiritual that we will you know, argue that 
Yes, this restaurant will be here in 40 million years. <laughs> Even in 40 million years, this restaurant will still be here because it's spiritual, it's eternal. <laughs> Actually, it is eternal in the sense that we're not seeing it yet in its eternal form. <laughs> because when you come in Govinda's restaurant, you're actually coming into my Kunta. My Kunta is eternal. <laughs> but the external feature, that will change. That, that's explained in the 18th chapter of the Gita. This, these questions about the modes of nature are answered very clearly in the Gita. But the main thing is not to fall under the influence of the modes of nature. That is the main thing. So, what Krishna says by surrendering to me. Very difficult to overcome the influence of the modes on the mind. But Ma may be a good young take when we talk about the one students to me can easily cross the mind. Right, this is another point. The modes of nature, Triguna, are actually derived from the tree Shakti, Ladini, uh, Sandini, and Sandit. Uh, these are the three modes of spiritual nature, three modes of the spiritual world. The, pleasure potency, the knowledge potency, and the eternality potency. And so they are reflected in this temporary material world as the three gunas. So again, if one simply utilizes what is manifested in this world in Krishna's service, then the spiritual mode <laughs> becomes visible, becomes apparent. <coughs> Those scientists, they try to find the cause of this world, but they, they say that something comes from nothing. It seems to be an ignorance. Yeah, this is more the end. What is the situation of passion? Well, Bhagavad Gita explains, in, in the mode of ignorance, knowledge is just foolishness. And uh, people are simply attached to one kind of work, like the scientists. The scientists, their whole process of so-called knowledge is completely uh, dependent upon their very primitive you know, experiments, their primitive attempts of uh, discovering things by the scientific method, which is very, very primitive. It's like, a, it's just a form of, of uh, tantra, you know. Shakta Tantra, Black Tantra, they do the same things as Tantras in the Killing animals, <laughs> scientists, they kill animals, they make experiments by killing animals. <laughs> and mixing chemicals and uh, you know, testing different formulas. This is the Shakta's rules. To derive power out of material elements. Motive, passion, as what Krishna explains means to see a different living entity in different bodies. It just means that the general bodily conception of life that everybody has, who is interested in uh, getting the fruits of his labor. This is passion. It manifests as uh, social consciousness. And then the mode of goodness, speculation, means smile what he wants. Thinking all is one. Everyone is one. So these are explained in the causation of the mode of passion. The causation of the mode of passion. How do you mean? Like those who are in the ignorance, they say that everything comes from love. In the movies, they say everything comes from drama. Those who are in the passion. Those in the mode of passion. They have, uh, well, Lord Krishna mentions demigod worship. They, um, uh, yeah, that's 
one thing, daily guardianship. Um, passion is between goodness and ignorance. It hovers between goodness and ignorance. It is a, it is a kind of media between the two. So in passion, you will find elements, you know, of both things. And they blend together just like there will be some conception of Brahman in the mode of passion, but it will be it's called Saguna Brahman, Brahman with form. Brahman is some demigod that is Brahman, Lord Shiva is Brahman. These are all influenced by conceptions of passion. What, it, what, what that is is a blending of goodness and ignorance. So mode of passion is very, um, it's creative. So there's so many speculations. Take your pick. <laughs> Anything else? Yes? Please, please explain the different stages of karma. When you scream on and try to huh? know all of this. But different stages of karma, like what the parapet karma and karma and what this and what this. Rabda karma means your present. Rabda means active. The present activities, the body you have now, that's Rabda karma. There is um, the karma bija, which is the seed of karma, the seed of desire. Just like now you are uh, tasting the fruits of previous activities. After enjoying those fruits, just like when you eat a fruit, what is left to seed. So the, uh, after enjoying in this body, seeds are planted in the heart, which in the future, future lifetimes, will grow into new reactions. And the seed grows uh, into a stalk, and then a fruit called palamukha. Stalk is, uh, what is it, kusha? So as it grows, the desire manifests, and the, the state of almost ripe fruit means one has become very much attached to satisfying this desire. One is now attaining the objects of his desire, working in that direction. And uh, the parabda is the result, the active result. <laughs> All right. Jiro Bhagwan. Yeah. 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 Yeah.